Good evening, and welcome to the New York Society Library. I'm on the board here and chair of the Lecture and Exhibition Committee. And we're so happy to be back in our lovely members room and look forward to many more live events. And it's great to see so many familiar faces. We're so lucky to have two such distinguished, passionate scholars and colleagues to discuss Virginia Woolf and her place in literature. Roxana Robinson and Anne Fernald will also discuss the recent Norton critical edition of Mrs. Dalloway and the new Oxford Handbook of Virginia Woolf, edited by Dr. Fernald with an essay by Roxana Robinson. Anne Fernald is professor of English and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Fordham University and the editor of the Norton Critical Edition of This is Salloway and the Oxford Handbook of Virginia Woolf. She's also the editor of the Cambridge University Press, as well as being the author of numerous articles and reviews on Woolf and feminist modernism. Roxana Robinson, a wonderful friend, a long time and enthusiastic library member, is the author of more than 10 books many inspired by Virginia Woolf, including Cost and the latest Dawson Falls, which almost seems like it was channeled by Virginia Woolf. <laughs> Her work has appeared in many publications. She has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts and teaches at Hunter College MFA program. And now let us welcome Anne Fernald and Roxana Robinson. Thank you so much for joining us, um, our two distinguished scholars and everybody in the room and everybody joining us by live stream. Um, I am just here to funnel a few questions to facilitate this wonderful conversation. So, for each of you, when did you first read Virginia Woolf and what struck you about her work when you first read her? So you go first, Anne, because you're the scholar and I'm just sitting here. Okay, so I tell you that I grew up with a very, very bookish and rather severe grandmother. And her favorite writer in the world was Virginia Woolf. And so I was absolutely determined not to read Virginia Woolf in the way of, you know, a, a child with a severe grandmother, brilliant woman, but not a loving one. And then I got to graduate school and I realized that this was not a sustainable uh, choice. And I took a class with Harriet Chessman at Yale on Gertrude Stein and Virginia Woolf, and I just fell in love at first sight. I mean, it was just absolutely a coup de foot for me. It was just, I couldn't believe it, and I never stopped reading her, and I never stopped thinking about her and studying her and wanting to know more about her. So I didn't read her until I was 21, and then I haven't stopped over the past more than 30 years. <laughs> So um, I don't have anything as dramatic as that, but um, I first read To the Lighthouse when I was in boarding school, and I still have that copy of St. Roxanna Barry, class one, if I read it as a senior. And um, just as Anne says, we had a wonderful teacher, a wonderful English teacher, and it just was like going into a new world. The writing was so different, it, and it allowed for so much, and it allowed for um, first of all, the beauty of the sentences. Any writer is so aware of the way every sentence sounds. And, and uh, Virginia Woolf was so accustomed to poetry being in her life. She had grown up with people reciting poetry, the Edwardians and the, and the Victorian poets, all the time. And in Into the Lighthouse, you see her father, um, Mr. Ramsey, re reciting poetry. So she had these rhythms and cadences in her mind. And they're present in her writing, in her fiction. Those sentences are like um, lines of poetry. And so I was astonished that somebody could write fiction in such an elegant and jewel-like way. And then the subject was one, as we all know from Virginia Woolf's um, nonfiction from her essays, she took up the challenge of what women were to write about and whether or not women's subjects were important. And she wrote that famous passage saying, um, if it's, a, if it's a, uh, the subject is war or sports or men competing with each other, then it's interesting. If it's a, the subject is a woman in a hat shop, it's not interesting. And Virginia Woolf called that out. 
out. She made that conversation happen. And for, I mean, I came to it long after she had written that, but it was, it's still true to a certain extent. And it was so exciting to see somebody put that question out into the world, so challenging the literary establishment. Everyone, do you really think that men's topics, men's lives, men's thoughts are more important than women's? Answer me that is what Virginia Woolf said. So it was it was just so shocking and exciting to, to read her ideas as well as those beautiful sentences. The sentences are really a stunner. I mean that's what I fell in love with first. I went to grad school graduate school thinking I would work on poetry. Mm -hmm. And the poetry of her sentences kept me studying Wolf. But to what you were saying about uh, putting the importance of women's lives at the center. Mrs. Dalloway has always been the book that's mattered to me most. Mm -hmm. And part of what I love about that is the cheek of, sometimes people think that Mrs. Dalloway is like Virginia Woolf, but I really think Mrs. Dalloway is a version of the woman that Woolf's mother wanted Woolf to become. Mm -hmm. And exactly what Woolf didn't want to become in that way that we have. Of, you know, I, my mom wants me to be a beautiful hostess, a perfect hostess. My mom wants me to be beautiful and care about my clothes, and I'm going to resist some of that. But when you're resisting that, you know that woman really well. And I think in Mrs. Dalloway, and part of what keeps pulling me back into that novel, and what's so fun about teaching that in the undergraduate classroom when you've got 18 year olds, is how much she makes <coughs> people who aren't naturally inclined to care about a wealthy woman who's throwing a party that day. It's not a very promising topic. You know, <laughs> Mrs. Dalloway said she'd buy the flowers herself. You think, well, geez, I don't really care. You know, but <laughs> you come to care. And I think what is so fun, one of the things that's so fun for me about Wolf as a novelist is you can almost see her setting herself a project, like this will be really hard. I want to write about a character and I want to go into a lot of detail about the character and I want to make her a woman that I'm inclined to dislike, a woman I'm inclined to dismiss, someone about whom I would say, you know, you care about gloves, that's not important. Right, and actually, no, it, I can see why it's important to Clarissa now that I know her a little bit better. Yeah, that's a great, um, that's a great way to look at Wolf's writing because on the face of it, Mrs. Dalloway doesn't really have like, like her. I mean, she is your mic on? Can't hear you. Can't hear me? Maybe it's just me. It's, it's, it's okay. Is it okay? Yeah. Can, can other people hear me? I'm sorry. It's better now. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's just better now. You're at the mic. It's better now? Yes. Just speak loud. Okay. Um, Mrs. Dalloway doesn't really have much of a life. I and mean, as, as Anne says, she's throwing a party, she's buying flowers. But Wolf um, inhabits her life with so many wonderful and moving pieces of information that you can't help but be drawn into it. It's, it's the accretion of facts that we we learn about Mrs. Dalloway. And then, of course, Wolf puts in this other story of Septimus Smith, which um, draws the book into very sharp and um, ten it, it brings tension into the book because the war, so you have a society hostess, and I think she was based on Kitty Maxey, isn't that what we are told? A woman that she knew, um, the society hostess, and then you have a war damaged veteran who is has lost the life that he had and is really desperate and can't figure out a way to go forward. So you have the threat of death and you have the presence of war brought side by side with this woman who is buying flowers and doesn't have children, sleeps alone, her marriage is very bland and and pale. She has a, she has a grown daughter. But oh, yes. that's right, she does have a daughter, I've forgotten that. Um, of course. Um, but you know, she has a she has a very narrow kind of life, or we're led to believe that, but Wolf makes it more and more important as it goes by. Can I ask you, when you were beginning to see yourself as a writer, maybe you've always seen yourself as a writer, but do you remember a point when you thought Wolf is gonna help me? figure out how to write a novel? So 
there are writers who read books about writing and who um, listen to what other writers say about writing and, and think it's, it's valuable. It's, that's not me. I never read books about writing. I don't want to know what other writers think about writing. So I've never used that kind of, I've never thought about it. I've never used that kind of assistance. What happens is the language gets into my head. Mm -hmm. And the ideas get into my head. And um, so the way Anne and I met was through Virginia Woolf. And I wrote a book called Cost. And um, it's not about any kind of Wolfian subject. It's about heroin addiction and Alzheimer's. Um, but I, and I started it off. And when I write novels, I use one book as a kind of a keystone for myself. And every morning, I write in the mornings. I sit down and I use that book and I read a few pages from it and I get it to know it extremely well. I know where every paragraph sits and every page. And there are different books for each book that I've written. I won't bore for you with what they are, but with the cost, I used Michael Cunningham's The Hours. And I read little bits of that book every morning. And so I had this voice and Michael Cunningham channels Virginia Woolf in a way that is absolutely otherworldly. I'm sure you know that. So I had those rhythms and I had her thoughts and her presence in my head. And it became kind of um, over, overpowering in a way. And I, and I would write sentences and I would think, that's Wolf's sentence. It's, it's my subject, but that's a sentence she would have written. And I told Anne at one point I was thinking, am I going to be you know, brought into court for this? <laughs> am I doing this too much? Is this not legal? <laughs> um, anyway, Anne, whom I didn't know, read the book and wrote a wonderful review of it and talked about the, the influence. I will see it immediately. I mean, it was just, I just was like, this is the one who's been reading nothing but Wolf. I mean, <laughs> the house in Maine, the painter, the struggles with figuring out what it means to be able to inherit something, you know, the pain of family connection. It was a re. But what I love about what Roxana does in that book, and that's why I'm interested in how you're describing your process, is that it's not a matching game, right? That's the worst kind of, or that's a boring to me kind of literary transformation, right? What's fun about the hours is there are three stories and they're interconnected and it's complex. And so you feel like Michael Cunningham is really doing an homage. He's not rewriting Mrs. Dalloway only right so it's more than just matching but it's riffing and transforming and adding and that's what's really cool about it but I think sometimes sometimes our heroes become our rivals creatively yeah and and so you will often hear if, if you ask if somebody is asked either an artist or a musician or a writer who are your influences often they will say oh I didn't have any <laughs> really, I, I sprang full blown out of my father's back. <laughs> um, and O'Keefe, whom I've written about too, I mean, she would never admit that she had any influences because there's that there is something that is so hard fought about finding your own presence in your own voice, your own presence as, a, as an artist. You really don't want to give up any of the credit for finding yourself. And so I sympathize with people who say, I had no influences, I just did it, did it all myself. But it's true that you, there are writers or artists or whoever you're drawing from, people who inform you of, of possibilities and make it possible for you to write in ways that you never had considered before. <coughs> Bruce Wolf was really excited about Proust, and that makes a lot of sense. And it's very hard to find a direct um, footnote to Proust, right? But you feel it if you know Proust, and I don't know Proust well, so please don't ask me a Proust question if I won't be able to answer it. But if you know Proust, you can feel that this is a woman who was reading Proust. But she would write in her diary at several occasions, I have to put Proust down because it's upsetting. You know, she couldn't do it. And Shakespeare is similar. You know, she'd be reading Shakespeare for pleasure or for a review, and then the words would get into her head, and she was so jealous of the greatness of their achievement. I mean, that's my word, not hers, but that's what you feel in the diary, is this intense rivalry in her. 
she and she says at one point, I teach Virginia Woolf to the lighthouse, and so I have all these sources. And she says at one point, oh, if I could only write like Proust, reading him is just transporting. It was it was torture, but also delight, delirious delight. And I had there's one sentence that she in this book that I'll read to you, which just sounds so Proustian. Um, and I think it's one sentence that is a whole paragraph. And you'll recognize this moment. It's after the dinner party. Disappearing as, just listen for this, wait for the period. Disappearing as stealthily as stags from the dinner table, directly the meal was over. The eight sons and daughters of Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey sought their bedrooms, their fastnesses in a house where there was no other privacy to debate every, anything, everything. Tansley's tie, the passing of the reform bill, seabirds and butterflies, people, while the sun poured into those attics, which a plank alone separated from each other, so that every footstep could be plainly heard, and the Swiss girl sobbing for her father, who was dying of cancer, in a valley of the Grisson, and lit up hats, flannel, bat, bats, flannels, straw hats, ink pots, paint pots, beetles, and the skulls of small birds, while it drew from the long frilled strips of seaweed into the wall a smell of salt and weeds, which was in the towels too, gritty with sand from bathing. <laughs> Is that virtuosity? <laughs> So she, I mean, you read that and you just think that's Proust speaking through Virginia Woolf. That's Virginia Woolf drawing and another source, which she found incredibly rich. She makes it her own, that's her own sentence, filled with her own subjects, um, parents, the, the rituals of contemporary life, all those things that the children had to discuss on their own. Um, the pill, panel, the frilled seaweed into the wall, um, but there's that Proustian sense of everything being part of the moment, everything being seen through the moment, the moment extended, the sentence going on forever. So it's it's wonderful to read her and see these other presences. It's great. I would like to throw in something that somebody brilliant put in the chat in our live stream just now. I'm going to have to paraphrase, saying Ilya Kaminsky, the poet, said that the greatest poet living in London at the time was Virginia Woolf, and her poem was Mrs. Dalloway. <laughs> so lovely. I seems like that uh, relates to what you're saying. Um, so going back to Mrs. Dalloway for a moment, um, you uh, created and edited a relatively recent version of Mrs. Dalloway. Um, can you tell us some of the things you learned in working with it in that context? And in particular, I hear there's a Homer reference. Yes, there's a great, that's one of my coolest discoveries is the Homer. So it's, um, I did in it a scholarly edition of Mrs. Dalloway for Cambridge University Press. And then I did a textbook for Norton um, on which I drew on the Cambridge edition for the Norton edition. And so the Cambridge edition has more footnotes, as many footnotes as the novel is long. And then I picked the ones that university and advanced high school students would need um, from that selection for the Norton. But what was what's fun in the Norton Critical Edition is you can put um, it become the book. The edition itself is a kind of anthology, and so there's a long introduction that talks about the novel, London and the novel, what Wolf knew about World War One. That's one of the really interesting things that I learned. So as a scholar, I like to, I call it kind of driving down the middle of the main street, right? There are a lot of scholars who are really, really interested in the most obscure byways and um, paths that go under the bramble that you can't see. And I really like to say, well, the novel's about London. What do we learn about London? The novel has a veteran in it. What do we know about World War One? I? I like to just drive down the main street I think my students are interested in characters. My students are interested in themes. And I like to start there and then go to the odd uh, wayside places that are interesting according to my students' curiosity and my own curiosity, right? But starting with something like World War I, one of the things that interested me most that I didn't know until I started intensively researching Mrs. Dalloway was how very much Wolf herself was affected by the war. <coughs> We know Wolf was a pacifist. She was in her early 40s when the war broke out. 
And so it would seem as if she was in a position to be relatively untouched by the war, as Christelle is pretty, seemingly pretty untouched by the war, right? And yet completely affected by the war. But Wolf's brother, Wolf's husband, Leonard, was a, would have been a conscientious, conscientious objector, but couldn't be drafted because he had a physical tremor that would prevent him from holding a rifle. Well, Leonard came from a large uh, Jewish family in London, and he had a brother killed by a shell that wounded his other brother. And when the brother had, who had witnessed the death of his brother came to visit Leonard in Virginia, Virginia wrote in her diary that she was surprised. She thinks that he's probably surprised that he doesn't feel more, which is precisely the thought she gives to Septimus about four years later in the novel. And so not only did she have a brother-in-law killed in the war and a brother-in-law who was traumatized by witnessing the death of a brother, but she also lost her friend Rupert Brooke. And not only did she lose her friend Rupert Brooke, but you know, you remember he was killed in 1916 before the Battle of the Somme, before World War I really turned into this war of attrition, when it seemed like a winnable war, when it seemed like a more traditional war. And so Rupert Brooke's truly beautiful, but very patriotic and very old fashioned war poetry, Wolf was kind of asked to promote that as a pacifist who knew things that Rupert Brooke, it was, he would never know because he had died. And she was sickened by the way that Rupert Brooke's image was sold to recruit more young men to become soldiers. So I think we underestimate the degree to which Wolf was involved in thinking about the war, was sympathetic to the plight of veterans, understood. I mean, I think we know that Wolf's own struggles with mental illness, the treatment for the mental illnesses she had and the treatment for what was then called shell shock, what we now call PTSD, was identical in the, in the 20s, right? And so she drew upon her own experiences with mental health doctors, her bad experiences with mental health doctors to depict what happened with Septimus. But I think it's even more than that. It's actually knowledge about combat, her own losses, that really affected me. And there's a moment I'm gonna pull it out of my bag There's, there's a moment when Septimus is at his most disturbed in the park, and he has this thought. It's a very upsetting passage because he's so not in his right mind. Scientifically speaking, the flesh was melted off the world. His body was macerated until only the nerve fibers were left. It was spread like a veil upon a rock. A veil upon a rock, that's something, right? It sounds almost biblical. It's something. What is it? A veil upon a rock. So I'm like, I'm going to figure out if this is an allusion to prior literature. So who's on a rock? We know Wolf loved Greek, Greek literature. She was reading a lot of Greek literature to write on not knowing Greek at the same time. So I'm thinking, okay, so Prometheus. So I read Shelley's Prometheus. I read every Prometheus. I can go to Ovid. Nothing. No veils on them. I mean, Prometheus is on the rock, but there's no veil. I can't figure it out. And then one night I'm reading the children's Homer from the 30s, my dad's copy of the children's Homer to my kids. And I get to book five of the Odyssey. Wolf did not like Homer. I get to book five of the Odyssey. And you remember, you know, the Odyssey's not told in chronological order, but there's a moment in the Odyssey when Odysseus and men have beaten the cattle, the oxen, and the sun, and they've all been killed. And Odysseus is alone, and he's on a ship, and Poseidon is still angry, and Poseidon breaks up the ship, and Odysseus is floating around in the Mediterranean just clinging to a mast. And Poseidon's like, that's too much help, you know, takes the mast away. And Odysseus is naked, floating around in the Mediterranean. And the goddess Eno takes pity on him and throws him a veil and says, you will not drown if you have this veil. And he gets the veil and he kind of body surfs onto the island of Phaeacia where Nausicaa finds him. But as he kind of body surfs onto the island, his flesh gets all torn up. And so he's got a veil, but his skin is macerated, 
like a veil upon a rock. So then I thought, okay, that's a clue. Like, I think I'm getting somewhere. And then I went online and I figured out what editions of Homer did Wolf have? And how do they translate the thing Eno throws him, right? Because it might be a veil, it might be a scarf, well, it's a veil. In two of the three translations of Homer, Wolf had it, so it's a veil. That's good. <laughs> then I go to the diary, and Wolf dated in her notebooks. So when she would sit down to write a draft of her novel, she would write, you know, June 23rd, and then she'd just continue the scene from the day before. And so you can look at her diaries and her manuscript. And on the day she wrote this scene, in her diary, she's like, oh, I'm rereading the Odyssey. I got up through book five. It's so boring. <laughs> and so that's it. That's it. So what does that mean? It's so cool, right? I mean, she's always smarter than us. She's always ahead of us. That's really exciting. But you know what else it means? Wolf is thinking about Ulysses and what Joyce is doing with Homer in, the, in Ulysses. This is 1925, it's just a couple years later. Septimus is Odysseus. He's an Odysseus figure. And that transforms, I think, how we think about the Odyssey, right? Because I think it's much richer. I think it's fun to read the Odyssey as like a boy's adventure book. I think it's really deeply moving as an adult to read the Odyssey as a story of what does it mean for a traumatized man to try and come home. And that's what Septimus is trying to do, do on this day. So it's not just, I mean, it's exciting, right? It's thrilling when you make these discoveries, but the discoveries themselves, then you press and you figure out that you've learned something about the character, right? And oh, that's the best. So is that, is that the most wonderful yeah. <laughs> piece of scholarship? And talked about this. Um, so since we made this connection, I have signed up for many of the classes that she's given some at, at the Center for Fiction, I guess, and she gave one last last winter on Mrs. Dalloway, and she told that story. And it, it's just, for anybody who's ever done scholarship, it is so thrilling to figure, be able to put these pieces into place and then to stand on it and say, this is what it means. It's I, I just it's that's a fun story. It's a fun, yeah. Thank you. I'm going to add one more question at you then. Um, so you both talked about how you got into work to begin with, but why did you focus on Wolf particularly as a scholar? How did that come about? When I was in graduate school, the, it was kind of the last gasps of deconstruction. And I couldn't understand a lot of what people were talking about. I was a very young graduate student. And then I would go to read Virginia Woolf, and she would talk about the same text, and it would be so clear. And it would be often smarter than what I felt like Derrida and Dumas were saying. And, and she's a woman, and she's a feminist, and she, when she writes about uh, male writers, she's interested in what they have to say about women. And that was persistently and consistently interesting to me. And I'm stubborn, um, but also she is so well read that she takes you to every other writer in the world that you might ever want to read. And then by extension, and this gets to our most recent collaboration, right? She's so inspiring to so many writers after her that, you know, many writers whom you wouldn't, corners of the literary world that you might not expect Virginia Woolf to travel to, you find people who've learned from and drawn on Virginia Woolf. So in the Oxford Handbook to Virginia Woolf, um, that's 39 chapters. Each, each chapter is about an aspect of Woolf's life. And the, the, Roxana has written a chapter, contributed a chapter on just one aspect of Woolf's legacy for contemporary fiction. So I asked Roxana to write about kind of how Wolf has inspired what we might call the novel of manners as it is today. And we see that in your work and Michael Cunningham's work and Zadie Smith's work. But then also there's another chapter on Wolf as a feminist novelist, right? And you think about like the Doris Lessing um, school of Wolfian successors. And then there's another chapter by a Spanish critic about Wolf and magic realism. 
that talks about Toni Morrison and Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Victoria Ocampo and how Wolf is continuing there. And then the novelist and essayist Stacey Gerasmo wrote about Wolf's legacies in experimental nonfiction, right? And then there's an essay by a curator about Wolf in nonverbal arts. So it's very strange and cool to imagine the fact that this uh, writer who's so well known for dense verbal efflorescences has inspired choreographers and photographers and sculptors, right? So these arts that don't use words at all um, have taken as inspiration. I, the image I have in my head from that is the idea that you could sort of sit down next to Virginia Woolf and from there be anywhere in literary history. I mean, it sounds like how we all want to do that. Um, so you just mentioned the visual arts and Roxana, um, Wolf's sister was a painter and you've written a biography of George O'Keefe, which you mentioned. Can you talk a little bit about the interplay between verbal and visual art? Well, um, yes, I mean, in uh, To the Lighthouse, which I know better than I know, Mrs. Dalloway, it, it is, of course, obvious and tremendously important that the, the, one of the two main women figures is Lily Briscoe, who is an artist. And that feels to me, Lily Briscoe feels to me like um, a, a character that is drawn both from Wolf herself and also from her sister, because her sister, Vanessa Bell, was a painter and a very serious painter and lived in the company of painters. Her, her, um, did she ever marry Dr. No, she no. Her, 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 her partner was a, her first husband, her husband was a critic and her, the man she lived with was, was an artist. So her life was informed by art and the art world. And so Wolf had um, access to everything that Vanessa was going through and talking about what it was like to be a woman artist what it was like to be an artist at all, how you could combine the life of a woman, the life of an artist. And she uses it, and it's a wonderful metaphor for writing. And there's a tradition in writing that you don't write about yourself, you don't write about writers, which is why um, Elizabeth Stroud's book about um, Lily Barton is so, Lucy Barton is so interesting because she breaks that rule. But um, so it's, it's quite common for writers to write about artists as though that's the, their route into that the creative world. So Lily Briscoe um, is the is the way that Wolf allows herself to ask all these really interesting questions. Is it and Mrs. Ramsey wants Lily Briscoe to get married and to be Mrs. Dalloway. She wants her to get married and have children and have a nice house in Hyde Park Gate and and be a a, a woman after Mrs. Ramsey's own heart. But Lily Briscoe has a queer, puckered little face and Chinese eyes, and she lives with her father, and she doesn't want to get married. She resists this domestic push that Mrs. Ramsey is giving her. And in that conversation is every woman's um, own thoughts. How much weight should I give love and marriage and um, the romantic life that that is so demanding, so fulfilling, but so demanding, how much value should I allow that to have in my life? And Lily Briscoe pushes against Mrs. Ramsey with her eight children and her country house and her house in London. And Lily Briscoe says, I don't want that. It's not more valuable to me than this tiny life I've made for myself, which is just me putting my easel on somebody else's lawn and hoping that no one looks over my shoulder. Mm -hmm. It's the worst thing for her is to have someone look at what she's doing. And as a writer, I can tell you, I don't show my work to anyone in early drafts. I don't show it to anyone until it's completely finished. I, there's no sort of workshopping. It's, and so I know how Lily feels. You do not want the eye, someone else's eye, to fall upon what you're doing. It's excruciating. But Lily, so what Lily's doing is incredibly brave. She's standing up against the weight of centuries, centuries of the patriarchy and the matriarchy. Here's Mrs. Ramsey saying, you must get married, you must have children. And little Lily Briscoe won't. And she says in her mind all the time that what she's doing is going to be forgotten, it's going to be left in a closet, it's going to be put under the bed somewhere. It's pointless. And yet, 
It is so important. It is so central to her life. And there's that one passage, and I wrote to Anne at one point, we were moving, and I said, all my books were in storage, and I said, tell me what page this <laughs> phrase is on, because I can't find it, and it's the phrase that you will all recognize, in which Lily Briscoe just says something like this, you can correct me, it's a queer life, this a, the painting life, it's like walking on a plank that's put out over the water, and you never know until you foot reaches it if the plank is still there. So there's that sense of artistic peril that you are in, that you live as an artist of any kind. And um, this sense of kind of danger, if you sink, you sink, you've lost your life, you've lost your, your life as an artist. And yet there's the drive, the urge to keep putting your foot down hoping the plank will be there before you sink into the waves. So Wolf uses this idea, the idea of the artist, um, borrowing her sister from her sister's life and her sister's work. She knows exactly how it works to be a, a woman artist at that time. We know about the canvas, we know about using the different colors. She knows the names of the colors, Viridian Green and, and um, the Scarlets. Um, so she knows all the workmen, the workmen's workmanlike aspects of being an artist, and she makes that into her, um, her this beautifully complex creation that combines the, the, the life of an artist and the life of a woman, and she uses visual arts as a way to talk about the literary arts. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So uh, I think this question might be addressed to both of you, but maybe you want to jump off with it, Roxana. Um, we've heard a little bit about influences on Wolf and certainly her influence on other writers. But what for you is Wolf's most important contribution as a writer? We think of her as a great innovator, but how would you describe that innovation? So Anne and I talked a little bit about this um, a few days ago. and. And both of us encountered Wolf through her fiction, which, as we said, is incredibly beautiful. And the, the, the creation of those sentences is very, very important to, to writers. But if that's all she had done, if she had simply only written these two masterpieces of poetry and lyricism and radiance, she would still not be the important writer that she is. And what she did, what for me, was to combine this incredible brilliance, this understanding of life that she puts into the novels, but also she is such a hard, driving, focused, clear thinking critic of the world. And so what she says, as, as I said earlier, is she says, is it really true, world, that you think men are more important, really, than all of us, than every woman, it's men? whose stories, whose ideas, whose accomplishments are so much more important that you don't want to hear our stories at all. I'm not allowed into the library at Oxford. I'm a woman. I'm not allowed in the doors. Is it Oxford or Cambridge? Cambridge, sorry. That's all right. Um, so, I that Oxford would have been bad. Yeah. Um, so she raises these issues that have been silent. No one, everyone knew about them. Everybody knew that all the boys in an English family were sent to school and the girls were not. They weren't, not only, not only were they not to sent to university, they weren't sent to school at all in the 19th century. They were, they were educated at home, if, if at all. And nobody's talked about that. Jane Austen doesn't talk about it. The, um, the Brontes don't talk about it. Virginia Woolf says, really? You're going to send the boys to, to school because only boys deserve education? Really, only boys deserve to put their thoughts down? She, she raises these very frightening, um, earth-shaking questions. And she puts them down on paper and she asks them of the world. And because she's so powerful, I mean, remember, Virginia Woolf comes from the literary world. She is not an outsider. She's not a peasant throwing stones at the, at the walls of the castle. She grew up in the castle. Her father is a famous literary critic uh, and, and scholar, and everyone she knows is Thackeray as her ancestor. She, she, knows everybody in the literary world, and she sends her first novel off to her half-brother, who publishes it at once. So she's <laughs> not somebody who has had to struggle to reach the inner circle. So she has a big leg up. But
but when she starts writing and she starts in her 20s, um, she just, she writes reviews and critics and says exactly what she thinks. And she, she says these things about the literary establishment. And her voice is measured, it's calm, it's absolutely in, well informed, and it's unforgettable. So she really challenges the whole literary establishment and the patriarchy in a way that it has never recovered from, and no woman will ever forget. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer. <laughs> I think about that um, passage in Moments of Being, her memoir, where she talks about her first reviews. And you see them as very strong and passionate, but she says, when I think about them in my tea table manners, right, the politeness. And in the first review she's writing, as was the tradition, then were published anonymously. So you wouldn't necessarily know that Virginia Woolf was the reviewer. But she thinks about herself. She says, my critical voice in those early days was like a, a, a young hostess handing out buns to a nervous young man at tea. Right, and it takes her a while to get that voice of strength. And even, you know, as a middle-aged woman, as an adult, she, there's a blistering diary entry where Ian Forster comes up to her and says, you know, the London Library, one of the subscription libraries in London has decided that, uh, you know, despite the fact that we don't ordinarily have women on the board, we do think that it might be all right to um, vote you on the board. Would you like to be on the board? And she says, God damn Morgan. I wanted to dip his head in a pail of awful. <laughs> <laughs> so, and she declines the invitation. No, no, thank you. I don't want your honor. You know, so she, she, the way that she deals with her anger, I think is really, really interesting to me. But more what keeps me going, I mean, anger is interesting and important, but what keeps me going back is the generosity of her reading and the transformational aspects of her reading. The way in which she can see Aeschylus has something to teach me, even though I know Aeschylus is not a feminist, right? I'm going to read him, I'm going to learn, and then I'm going to talk about him in a way that makes it impossible for the boys to say that Aeschylus only belongs to them. So there's a real democratizing spirit. So while it is true that Wolf is a terrible, terrible snob, while it is true that she says, you know, appalling things about Americans, while it is true that she's racist, it's also true that there's this democratic impulse in her that's really opens out. Right, and thinks about, well, Daniel Lefoe, he's great. You know, one of the reasons why he's great, Mal Flanders, that's a great character, right? So the reasons that she likes Defoe have to do with the perception of his sympathetic imagination of a woman. Um, and so that imaginative generosity, I think, has enabled writers like Toni Morrison to learn imaginatively from Wolf even though we know that Wolf would have been a racist. I mean, we know she was a racist, and we know that she wouldn't have been like kind to Toni Morrison had they crossed paths, right? But so there's some kind of transitive property of generosity, I think, that, that I really like and am inspired by. That's a great way to look at it. That's beautifully put. Um, so, of course, we have lots of writers in the library membership, and I'm sure some listening and watching tonight. Um, can you talk a little bit about specific writing lessons that you've taken from Wolf and what an aspiring writer might learn from reading her? Well, as I say, I, I don't, I, I mean, there, all the things we've been talking about, I think, are useful for writers. Um, the beauty of the language, um, the the newness of the ideas that she was presenting. Um, and I, I think writers can find, there's so many parts of her, her, her writing is so rich and so complex. There's so many things that you can find in it. Um, it would be hard to set out as a series. Do you, right, can you think of specific things? 
I was thinking today, there's a paradox, I don't know if this is a helpful lesson or not, but there's an interesting paradox. In her criticism, speaking of generosity, in her criticism and her reviews, she's very careful to judge books by what they're trying to be. And so she will look at a novel, a memoir by an aristocratic lady that tells funny stories about parties that the lady has been to and things about how the cabbages didn't really grow that year because of the rain and say, this is wonderful, it's delightful, the anecdotes are sparkling and it, you know, for a memoir of a fancy lady, this is a terrific example of fancy lady memoir. And she doesn't try and say, but it's no lyric. It's not trying to be lyric, it's a fancy lady memoir. That's the kind of book, but we read those sometimes. And so she's very careful about that and very smart about that. And she, she's a very Catholic small c reader. And so she reads lots of different kinds of books and judges them by what they're trying to be. But then when you look at Wolf's books, they're uncategorizable, right? I mean, Flush is a stream of consciousness novel from the interiority of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's dog. <laughs> what is the genre of that book? <laughs> you know, or um, The Voyage Out seems like it's a building to a but the main character dies and the book goes on for three chapters afterwards. Well, that's not how buildings Roman and work, you know, and so to the lighthouse was going to be an elegy. Three guineas seems like, oh, that's an anti-fascist feminist pamphlet, but it's written as three fictional letters to gentlemen, and it has 40 pages of footnotes. What would you call that for, you know? And so some things really, she, there's a lot of play that I really love, and I think that's, that, that's just interesting. One of our live stream participants um, mentions hard work and endless revision. Um, it, the person who's reading the, uh, sorry, the annotated Mrs. Dalloway, I guess is the reference here, and reading things about the revision process and how intensive it was. So um, that's a writing lesson, absolutely. There, and she wrote, she would write by hand and then type and then revise and write it again. So if you look at the Holograph drafts of Mrs. Dalloway, we have the handwritten copies of Mrs. Dalloway. Um, you can see her starting over again, you know, and so there are three different notebooks and they're all, most of her stuff, most of her manuscript material is downtown at 42nd Street at the New York Public Library in the Berg Collection. Um, but Mrs. Dalloway's drafts are in London at the British um, Library. And when you go and look at them, you'll see three or four times the beginning of the novel, you know, and that was true for all of her books, is, you know, start, this is starting over. So yes, revision, absolutely. A certain fearlessness, possibly, in yes. being willing to start over. Right, I like that. Um, so here's a kind of big thought-provoking question, and then I think we might move to some questions from the audience, if that sounds good to you. Um, you mentioned to me that you've been in conversation off and on since 2008, I think it is, about how, yeah, about how Wolf nurtures, sustains, challenges, inspires us as writers, uh, whether scholarly or nonfiction or creative, and teachers and people. In the light of that ongoing conversation, what is most important about Virginia Woolf today, and how do you each bring her to your students and to those you influence? So the course that I teach is called um, Introduction to the Modern, The Role of Compassion. And I start with Flaubert, we read Madame Bovary, then we read Anna Karenina, then we read some Chekhov, then we read Edith Wharton, who's not really a modernist, but I wanted another woman in the class. Um, and then we read To the Lighthouse. And so compassion is kind of the, the continuing theme that I want those students to recognize and the fact that um, I believe it's really compassion that is the great engine of great fiction and that you don't find if, if there is something, if a work does not contain compassion, we don't remember it. It's not going to be thought about in 150 years. All these books have compassion as, at the heart of them. And um, so to the lighthouse, I teach um, using all these things that we've been talking about. It's, the beauty of the language is incredibly important. You can, you can read that book aloud as music. It's, it's so beautiful. Um, and the, but the way the family is presented is incredibly important. And I think um, Virginia Woolf was 
was deeply engaged by that idea. Her own family was, like all of ours, was complicated and, and difficult and the fact that she lost her mother and then her beloved older sister within a very short period of time um, was devastating to her. So the way she approaches emotional challenges and the devastating parts of life, I think, are really important in this book. And um, the way she makes detail, the way Proust does, makes detail in integral to the fabric of the narrative itself, so that we remember these moments in, in To the Lighthouse. We remember um, Menta's brooch that she loses on the beach and how Paul is going to go and find it at daylight. And, we remember um, Mrs. Ramsey running across the lawn wearing a fur coat and slippers and a, and a deerstalker's hat. Um, so all these things that she gives us, um, and they're not just silly details, they're details that inform these, our understanding of the characters. And this rich, um, underlying sense of compassion. Mrs. Ramsey is the most, one of the most compassionate women in people in all literature, I think. And she wants to sustain the world, she wants to, to sustain her eight children, her incredibly difficult husband, um, and all the poor people that she's ever thought of. That's, that's her mission, <laughs> right? Um, and all the sick people she's ever thought of. She wrote a book on, on being a, a nurse, being an, an attendant of sick people. So compassion is a very, very rich part of that book, and that's one way that I introduce it to my students as well as all the other things we've been talking about tonight. So that's a great answer. It's a beautiful answer. And while you were talking, I was trying to think about, I was listening, I was listening, but I was also thinking about how to contribute and maybe say something a little bit different from what we've said before or so far tonight. And I think there are two things for me. And one is, that Wolf's life is incredibly interesting to us. There's no getting around it. And I don't uh, shy away from that because I think it's a fascinating life and it's an incredibly rich life. <coughs> it's also a life that was marked at its beginning with a tremendous amount of sorrow. And one of the most powerful things for us in any time, but maybe perhaps more vividly in 2021 than it has been prior to this, is the alchemical process of turning that suffering into art. To think about someone who lost so much before the age of 30 and then became a novelist and wrote nine novels and 400 essays and two long feminist pamphlets and a biography and lived a rich life full of social occasions, had a marriage, had a love affair with a really foxy British aristocrat. Um, you know, I mean, had a London house, had a garden. I mean, we should all be so lucky to have half of the splendor of her life. And she didn't turn her back on the pain of losing her mom at age 13. She didn't turn her back on the injustice of being abused by her half-brothers, but she was able to turn it into art, and that's such a powerful lesson for all of us to think, if we survive this, we can make something of it. Like, that is a, that's humanly possible, and I think hope lies there. And the other thing I love, and this is a little cheekier, but is her ambition. Is, and I think for a lot of my students, but for a lot of us, we've never encountered such a nakedly ambitious woman who's also a genius. And I think it's really, really powerful to imagine a woman imagining herself as great as Shakespeare. Thinking, thinking to herself in a way that's probably a little old fashioned to us now, but in a way that was totally contemporary to her. Like, who's the greatest writer? Okay, how do I make myself as great as that? And I love the idea of setting your sights that high and seeing how close you can get to it. So that's for me really inspiring. Great answer. It's a wonderful answer. Yeah, I love that. This has been a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much. Um, 
I think we might take some questions from the audience and we'll take some from those in the live stream if you want to throw them into the chat, if that sounds good to you. Hi, um, thank you for, uh, uh, do you want to, I'll take your mask up while you're talking. Thank you so much. It, it, it was, wonderful experience listening to the two of you. It was a scholarly experience. It was an enlightening experience. Um, what, I, what I'm thinking of, unfortunately, is that we have the platform here in this room to appreciate genius and say, okay, this person was a racist, but this is the reason why we can not take this person down and go forward. I'm very concerned in the contemporary society that we don't live in this beautiful world and that so many great writers of the present and of the past now are being taken down and playwrights. Plays are being rewritten for Broadway. Things are being said we can't show this because it is an affront to our values of society today. Yet we're able to say it's okay. And I agree, by the way. I mean, I'm not saying this in contention. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this that I wish that people like yourself could go and perhaps broadcast more of your views <laughs> beyond a drawing room and take it on the chin so that more people can be exposed from you know from this generation onward. We need people like you to say it's okay. This is the context because genius and brilliance is not just Virginia Woolf's ballad. Other people, of course. And so I just, I just, I, I hope that you know you expand your views to greater audiences. Well, we're both teaching her work to writing students and, and other and undergraduates. So we are spreading the word as best we can. I agree with you. It, it's important to recognize both aspects of the work. That, uh, she was a genius, and we have much to learn from her. And also, there are these pockets of her character that we don't accept today. But that doesn't mean that the work is. And it's hard. I mean, there's sides to other. Of course, and I'm sides that you absolutely. And I think that generosity and calling in rather than calling out is a lovely way to think about this. But there are times when it's not ideal to read certain texts. You know, there are times when the moment actually doesn't call for um, amplifying ugly views or views that will hurt people's feelings, right? Even if we can see like, oh, this is really well written or it's a perfect sonnet, but ooh, well, I don't know what he's saying about women, it's a little disturbing. Well, then maybe we'll teach a different sonnet today, right? I'm not saying cancel it. I'm just saying like, you know, we think about this room, we think about the people who are watching, we think about 2021. We may make a different decision in 2022. We may make, have made a different decision in 2015. So, I'm not interested in canceling everybody, anybody. I'm hoping for grace and invitation from you, and I hope to extend it to others. But there are times when there are texts that I don't teach as often anymore, or I only teach to graduate students because the text is, there's a the novel that I love that's also anti-Semitic. And the time it would take to explain to my students why, despite the anti-Semitism, I think it's worthwhile, isn't worth it because I don't want my I don't want my students to read the hatred. It's awful, and so even though I find a lot to value in the text, it's not my text anymore. Hmm. You know, and there may be another moment when I can teach it again, but that's not right now. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. A question from the live stream that might go along with this a little bit. Does either of you know any scholars of color who work with Wolf? It was very important to me in assembling the 39 chapters that I had, and it is by far the most diverse uh, volume on Wolf. And so there are many 
authors of color who work on Wolf. The first chapter in the Oxford Handbook to Wolf is written by my friend and colleague, Irma Sashagiri, who's Indian, who teaches at Knoxville. Um, there are lots and lots, of, there are, I would say, four or five chapters in the Wolf Handbook itself, written by scholars who are people of color. There is really wonderful work on wolf and race, including Dr. Sashagiri's first book, Race in the Modernist Imagination, which has a chapter on um, to the White House in it. So yeah, there's a ton of work by scholars. So not only has Wolf been read and important to creative writers, but she's also been engaged with, read, thought about, dissected by, celebrated by scholars who are people of color. Um, I'm wondering about other than the character of Septimus, where you, where you talked about how does Wolf's works fit into the what you might call the interwar period, with all the doom after World War One and the upcoming World War Two and the death and destruction. You know, I wonder if the great generation. Everything is interwar, right? And so, my 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 friend, the scholar Paul Saint Amour. Um, has this beautiful argument, um, what is the book called? It's gone out of my head. But it's about uh, kind of how the people in London were kind of pre-traumatized by the anticipation. You know, after the war ended, people knew that there was going to be another war. They knew that the end of the First World War hadn't concluded the conflicts in Europe and by extension globally. And so people are kind of wandering around. So you think about that skywriting scene in This Is Dalloway, that's not just, oh, cool, we have technology for skywriting. It's, oh, right. Aerial bombardment in the next war is going to be much worse than it was in the First World War. Of course, it was devastatingly. But you think about her last novel, Between the Acts, which is set on a beautiful, flawless summer day in June 1939. And by all accounts, the weather in the summer of 1939 was glorious. It was a perfect summer. And so to be writing in 1940, 1941 about, and there's a character who clucks her teeth at the store-bought cake, as if to say, couldn't you get a maid to cook the cake? Why don't you have a chef making a cake for you? But she's writing it at a moment when you can't get store-bought cake. There's no store-bought cake in England in 1941. There's no sugar. There's no butter. You don't have enough butter. You, if you have a, your ration of margarine, you are not using it to make a cake. First of all, it's not enough. Second of all, that's a waste, right? And so it's really everywhere. And I think I'm talking about sadder stuff, right? But there's also a strain, not in a Bernie Spotter hair way, but there is a strain of, which I love, it's delightful, right? But the, that party of the jazz age, right? Um, but there is a strain of determination to take pleasure in life, too, I think. That also strikes me as very interwar. Um, I hope that helps. Okay. Well, I don't know whether this is a question, but it strikes me that the structure of uh, the lighthouse. Uh, and there is that middle section, which is kind of the very enactment of interwar. Uh, and my students recently, just, I mean, what happens is that the interior of the house is sort of the persona, uh, the character of, of these 20 pages. And then every once in a while in brackets, it'll say something like, Julian was killed by a shell, you know, or so that, the war is going on between brackets, and I think it's a kind of metaphor for the idea of an interwar period. Um, and, and Anne also has an, a great scholarly um, comment about the time passes that sec section and when it was written. So you tell it during the strike. Oh, right, right. I forgot that. So I think that's so fascinating to me about To the Lighthouse. So most of To the Lighthouse will grow in her country place in Sussex, as you can imagine, right? She's thinking back on childhood summers in Cornwall. But the time passes section, which is imagining this empty house and almost narrated by the house and offering in brackets things that have happened to the family, 
she wrote that in 1926 in London during the general strike at a moment when London was like an empty house because the subways, the buses, the taxis weren't running, there were no newspapers. And so one of the things that I think unlocked her imagination about thinking about, and this really is, was vivid to me in the pandemic, right? If you think about what New York felt like in the early months of the pandemic, and it's like, this is my city, but it's not my city. This is not the same, this is not, this is an empty city. This is a grieving city. This is a broken city. This is, and yet, like, I can still get from one place to another as I, you know, the, the, the geography hasn't changed. But everything about the feel of being present in the city is different. And I think when you think about how the general strike informed that, I also think that's really interesting because it shows you the way that Wolf is political in a really creative and smart way because it's a very subtle imaginative sympathy with the miners with the workers who were on strike a very subtle imaginative sympathy with what it means to be making a protest yeah i love that and talked about that in one of the talked about that in one of those one of our classes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that was fun yeah. Um, I wonder if you could give us some uh, guidance on uh, Wolf's uh, biographies. Hermione Lee is the best. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Just read Hermione Lee. I've been reading her on Tita Thornton. It's so oh, she's so thorough. But she does Wolf proud, does she? Oh, it's a beautiful biography. It is absolutely a star. And so smart about how to talk about her sexuality, how to talk about her suicide, how to talk about her mental illness, clear-eyed, even-handed, generous, just thumbs up. I mean, just, it's, it's, a, it's a great, great book. And then after that, you can just keep reading biographies of Wolf, and you're like, oh, I don't really like it. No, but, but there, I mean, there's a bajillion of them, right? So, but, but, but for my Question from the live stream. Do you want to talk a bit about her, I think, Wolf's tunneling process in discovering Mrs. Dalloway? So, how do you write a novel that's set on a single day? This is the challenge, right? And actually develop character, right? If you took any one of us in 24 hours, we, we I mean, if you picked the wrong day, we could seem like quite shallow characters. And so how do you figure out how to give people that interiority? So she called it a tunneling process. So I think I figured out how to give my characters this backstory, right? And so it becomes this third plot of Mrs. Dalloway almost, right? So you've got Clarissa's day, one of the people she encounters in London on that day, and you've got Septimus's day, and then you've got Peter's memory of when they were 18, and what Clarissa was like when she was 18. And as we get to know Peter Walsh better, the man whom she loved but never married, and as we hear him talk about Sally, the, the girl Wolf loved but never had an affair with, and then as we meet Peter and Sally in their 50s, we are able to piece together to kind of triangulate the fullness of their characters. So it's really, really clever. And it just, I mean, the telling process is a, is a wolf's way of saying something like what we might call a flashback, right? I mean, it's not, it's not super elaborate. But what's beautiful about it, and you can see it on the very first page of the book, right? One of the things I always do when I teach Mrs. Dalloway is ask, when are we with Clarissa at 52, and when are we with her at 18? Mrs. Dalloway said she would buy the flowers herself, for Lucy had her work cut out for her. The doors would be taken off their hinges. Rumpelmeyer's men were coming, and then, thought Clarissa, what a morning, fresh as if issued to children on a beach. What a lark, what a plunge, for so it had always seemed to her when, with a little squeak of the hinges, which she could hear now, she had burst open the French windows and plunged at Burton into the open air. How fresh, how calm, 
Stiller than this, of course, the air was in the early morning, like the flap of a wave, the kiss of a wave, chill and sharp, and yet for a girl of 18, as she then was, see that? It just slides. And there are a couple phrases in there where she's in both places at the same time. And she teaches you how to read that double time. And we see something that those of us who are middle-aged know, right, is that we're the same, right? There's so much of us that's the same. And then we see, oh, but it's different. I mean, it's very different to be 18 than it is to be in your 50s. But you're also still yourself, you know, so I think. That, that, that's probably more than you asked for about the time. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Anything either of you would like to add that hasn't been said? Uh, hours and hours. <laughs> <laughs> we, could, we could talk for hours. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. This has been fantastic.